Greetings to you all in the name of Jesus, and welcome to Bible in a Year, Day 47. We are moving right along and uh, having a good time, too, doing it, by the way. Uh, thank you for all of the uh, comments, all of the reflections. Thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you for reaching out via email, um, for taking the time really out of your day. And uh, I appreciate that. And it's a blessing. Iron sharpens iron. And uh, I've learned a lot through these discussions. And I pray that this has been a blessing to you. If you're just joining us for the Bible in a Year series, welcome to Day 47 feel free to pick right up where we are and uh, join the journey with us for the rest of the year. Make that commitment. You don't have to go back all the way to the beginning to start from scratch or to start from the first day and then catch up if you don't want to. Don't burden yourself. But if you have the mind and the will and the determination to do so, by all means, get wealthy in the word. May the Lord bless you and open your eyes to behold wondrous things out of your law. May the Lord God of truth reveal himself to each and every one of us as we continue in this journey through the Bible. Um, Psalm chapter 22, I'm not going to touch on that today, but I do want to just mention that this is a very prophetic psalm. This is a psalm that it, it speaks about the sufferings of Jesus. And uh, it, it was prophetic in the sense that David, being moved upon by the Spirit of God, spoke of the Lord that was to come. And uh, there are many prophecies that Jesus fulfilled to the T. The odds of which are astronomical in being fulfilled, that he met all of them, the probability is out of this world, but he did it. And he is the Messiah. He is the savior that we were looking for, the Christ, the savior of mankind. And I thank God for the work of the cross and what he did through Jesus. Let's go right into Mark. We're picking up where we left off yesterday. And uh, I wanna look at verse 30. Here's just an interesting note something that it's not shouted, it's not obvious throughout the uh, texts of the New Testament, but a fun fact nevertheless, if you will. I, uh, I use the King James Version, and I'll be reading from the King Jimmy. Please feel free to follow along with whatever version you have, whatever version it is that you're comfortable with, and, uh, or you can listen to me dictate to you in the Old English. Mark chapter 1, verse 30. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. Simon, this is Peter. Scripture shows us that Peter's wife's mom was sick, his mother-in-law. Well, that tells us that Peter is married or was married at one point. We don't really hear about Peter's wife or of the wives of the other disciples. You don't really hear about that. But here we see that Peter has a wife or at least at one point in time had a wife whose mother-in-law is, is now around, who, whom we are reading of. So that's just an interesting little fact or side note that's kind of tucked away in the scriptures there, I thought, to highlight. Let's go down to verse number 34. The kingdom of God has come. One of the things that Jesus said in his ministry is uh, that the kingdom of God has come or is come near or is at hand. And there was always something that happened when the kingdom of God manifested or showed up. And that was the casting out of devils and the healing of of the sick, diseases and infirmities and all kinds of disabilities and debilitations were healed by the Savior. Here is one of those instances. 
Let's look at what the scriptures say in verse 34. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. Evidence that the kingdom of God has come is when sick people are healed and people that are in bondage to demonic activity are delivered. Does this still happen today? Absolutely. Devils are, are still being cast out of people. People today are still being delivered from demonic bondages, demonic strongholds. People are still being delivered from the power of demons, from the power of darkness, and demons are being cast out. It happens. I've cast demons out of people. I've seen people get demons cast out of them. It's very real today. I've seen the sick people being healed. I've laid hands on the sick and they've recovered. I've prayed for myself in times of sickness and pain and God heard me and healed me. I was talking to a brother yesterday that was telling me that he had been praying for people. He had been, been feeling led to pray for people and God has just started healing people. And he said, man, I'm speechless, bro, because God has just been healing people. And it happens today. It's a manifestation and evidence that the kingdom of God has come. Even so, let the kingdom come. And we are people of the kingdom. I do want to point out in verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. The Son of Man prayed. The Son of God prayed. The Anointed One, the Messiah, Jesus, who was called Christ, prayed. He took time to pray. What you see happening in verse 34 is a result of his prayer life. Prayer is a demonstration of faith. You're not going to pray to someone that you don't believe in, at least not on a consistent basis. I don't know. Maybe you might try to talk to Buddha for a couple of days to see if Buddha answers. Who knows what people are praying to these days. And they're talking to this statue or they're talking to this God, this created image, and they don't answer. But God answers. We know that God answers and that God speaks to his people. Many of you can bear witness that God has communicated with you, given you instructions, helped you, guidance, wisdom. God speaks to his people today. And it's imperative that we find ourselves taking time to pray. Jesus got up early, before it was daytime. The scripture says, a great while before day. Let's, let's assume that day was um, determined to be when the sun comes up. Let's just say, hypothetically, six o'clock in the morning. The Bible says that he was up a great while before day. I would imagine, speculating here, maybe three hours. Maybe Jesus got up at three o'clock to go to a solitary place to pray. This shows us, you know what? It's imperative that we all have our time to pray with God. Jesus was in the house. He got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place. He wanted to be alone with God. He went out of his way to be with God. That's the example that he set. That's the life that we should live. There are times that, you know what? We need to go out of our way to pray, out of our way to get in touch with God. And we need to get up early and make time. Everybody has time. I've heard people say, well, I don't have time to do this. I don't have time. No, no, no. Yes, you do. We all have the same amount of time. You got 24 hours. I got 24 hours. You got seven days a week. I got seven days a week. Every single one of us has time. It's how we use it. I would suggest take the time from somewhere and go 
and pray. There was a time, I remember um, last year when I went to the annual prayer partners retreat, and that's a ministry that my pastor has where uh, a select group of men are invited to become a part of this ministry. It's a prayer ministry, powerful, powerful ministry. And uh, we, we go there and all day long we're in training, we're studying the scripture, we're listening to the teachings, we're, we're in prayer often all throughout the day. And at nighttime we kind of chill and relax and play dominoes and whatnot and uh, fellowship. And then early in the morning it's time to go at it again. Well, it's very easy not to pray in the morning then because you're in a dorm full of people and it's just not convenient. But I determined that, you know, I want to continue in my prayer. So I left <laughs> early, a lot earlier than I would have normally gotten up. And I went to a solitary place on the mountain. We were in the mountains at the time. And I spent some time there. I, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes. It wasn't hours that I spent out there. But hey, I put in the effort and I did something that I didn't do before. Glory be to God. That's growth. But sometimes you got to go out of your way. Like, let's say the holidays are coming up and you're spending time with family. Family's coming over or you're going to be with family. Take time to pray. Go to a solitary place. If you're in a room full of people, step out and be alone with God. God might call you into prayer in the middle of the day. You might be busy. You might be in the middle of Walmart and God calls you into prayer. Respond, answer, go to the bathroom, go back out into your car and drive to the back of the parking lot and then meet God and be like, hey, Lord, I'm here. You, I felt like you called me to pray. How can I serve you? Do that. That's the kind of life that Jesus is modeling. That's the kind of life that's empowered to manifest the glory and the power of the kingdom because we ourselves are portals of God's power. We ourselves become a gateway for his power to pour through us. And that's an important place to be, an important role to fulfill. And we all, as the children of God, have that privilege. So I want to encourage you to pray. Let's slide down to verse 44. And the scripture picks up and saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, shew thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. Jesus healed the man and told him, listen, don't tell anybody what I did. And the man went and blasted Jesus. I mean, he put Jesus on blast, told everybody. And because of that, Jesus couldn't walk into the city openly anymore. They all knew, they all expected. Jesus wanted to be able to do his thing and, and walk throughout the city so that he can be about his father's business, but now he couldn't. The power of just receiving instructions, even though we don't understand what God is doing or what God is instructing, it's good for us to follow. One more section here in Mark chapter 2. No, no, no. Wait, wait. I got ahead. We are in Mark chapter 2, but there was one verse that I wanted to point out. Verse number 4. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, because your boy snitched, well, not snitched maybe, but he blasted the matter, and now there's a whole lot of people. <coughs> and when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. These are good friends to have. Friends that will carry you to Jesus when you are not able to yourself. These are intercessors, prayer warriors that lift you up and it's good to have. When Jesus saw their faith, 
He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. I just want to pause here. One, these guys had faith in, in, in Jesus. Two, their faith was evidenced. The Bible says that Jesus saw their faith. How? What did Jesus see? The where he could say he saw their faith. These friends broke through the roof to lower their lame buddy down to where Jesus was because they knew, having heard from all these other people that this man heals people, they believed, hey, he can heal our friend. We need to get him to Jesus. And they did it any way possible. Their faith was evidenced by works. And it was the works that Jesus saw. James says this, faith without works is dead. Had these men not expressed their faith by their works, their friend would not have been healed, even though Jesus would have healed him. This shows us the power of our faith and the evidence of our faith, which is works. The things that we do that show that we believe, God sees that also. And he looks for that. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. Against tradition. Here, here's another concept that is important for us to get a hold of. Mark chapter 2, verse 16 through 17. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Pharisees were all concerned about their tradition. Jesus didn't care about the tradition of man. Not even religious tradition. Just because a religious sect creates a tradition or upholds a tradition doesn't mean that it is truth. I think that the most important thing is to love the truth, is to desire the truth, and to want to know the truth regarding all things. That, to me, is more important than anything else. Having a love for the truth. Glory be to God. Do you love the truth? I'm not talking about your truth, something that you deem to be your truth. I'm talking about truth, absolute truth. Do you love truth enough to hunger for it and to search for it? That's where you want to be. Let's slide into the Old Testament. And let's continue the journey with Moses and the children of Israel. If you will obey my voice. God is the same God today as he has always been. This is good to know while we are going through the Old Testament, because you're going to see a side of God. God is the same. He's got the same personality. It doesn't change. So although we don't follow the law like they did in the Old Testament, we can still Discover the mind of God in these commandments that he gave. This reveals his mind, his thinking. Let's look what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. This is God speaking. And how I bear you on eagles' wings. Didn't they wait on the Lord? <laughs> Yeah, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They waited on God over 400 years to be delivered. And he says, and brought you unto myself. I brought you to me. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then shall ye be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Key words, if ye will obey my voice. The same is true today. Today in the New Testament, Scripture 
isn't null and void because we're in a New Testament or a new dispensation. We still have to obey the voice of Jesus. If we want eternal life, then let us do what the Savior said needs to be done. Point blank, period. We can't do it our way. We never were able to do it our way, and it's not going to count now if we do it our way. If we take Scripture and interpret it into what we want it to mean because we have some kind of bias or because of some kind of pride issue, and we're making it to say what we want it to say, well, we've created a God for ourselves. No, that's not how it is. We have to obey Jesus. We have to obey the voice of God. We have to obey the Word. It's always been that way, and it will continue to be that way until Jesus comes and establishes His kingdom. And even then, His Word will be law until eternity. I wanted to highlight in verse 10 of chapter 19, there's a lot of types and uh, foreshadowing, typologies and symbolism that you can pick up in the Old Testament. Paul makes mention of a bunch of those when you read his epistles, his letters and whatnot. He'll, he's often speaking of the Old Testament and showing types and shadows and whatnot. For example, the tabernacle is uh, a type of um, the salvation plan. And it's, it's very, very powerful how God laid out these secrets, these insights all throughout the scripture. Here in verse number 10 is one of those instances. And the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. This right here is pointing to water baptism. It's, it's a purification Washing is a purification. It's a making clean. Baptism is a purification, a kind of making clean where the blood of Jesus washes us from all of our sins. Glory be to God. And here we find all throughout the Old Testament littered verses like this that allude to New Testament principles. The Bible is full of this stuff. One could probably write books and volumes on the types and shadows of the Old Testament that we find fulfilled in the New Testament, and that we also see practiced in the New Testament. For example, circumcision is one of them. In the Old Testament, it was physical, a physical circumcision. In the New Testament, Paul says that, no, the circumcision is of the heart cutting away the things that are not pleasing to God and being renewed by the Spirit of God. That's one example. It's the same thing. Circumcision was a, a foreshadowing. It was a symbol of something, us getting our hearts right. So the Bible is littered all throughout the Old Testament with examples like this one. God has boundaries. Here's another verse to highlight, verse number 12. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed achoo, to thyself, that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall surely be put to death. God has boundaries. God's a God's a principle. He doesn't change. If God had boundaries then, he's got boundaries today. You can't violate his boundaries and then expect to be cool with God. Boundaries, there's a reason why boundaries exist. Boundaries are there for protection. They're there to preserve. Especially if you have boundaries, personal boundaries, like, hey, you know, you can't, don't, don't lie to me because it, it harms me. I don't, I don't like that. I need to protect myself. So God has boundaries. The Old Testament is full of boundaries that God has. Although they were types and, and symbols, a lot of these boundaries, the principle behind the idea of boundaries stays the same. God has boundaries today. Be ye holy, for I am holy. We can't come to God on our own accord. Boundaries. His holiness demands boundaries. God is a God of boundaries today. So that if we sin, if we violate the boundary, there's a consequence. And then we need to go and confess our sins and make sure that our heart is right with God and thank God for his unlimited mercy. Where am I with my time? Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Let me, 10 commandments. Here we are, the 10 commandments. I'll um, hope that time permits, I can't see in this white shirt. Praise God. The 10 commandments. This is the moral law right here. There are three types of laws uh, that you find in the Old Testament and we're gonna get into it because we're doing the whole Bible. So the Ten Commandments is the moral law. Then there is the ceremonial laws, all of the things that the priests had to do, the, the offerings and the sacrifices. And if you do this and that, then you need to do this and this to make it right. And there's this sacrifice for this sin and that sacrifice for this offense. And there was a ceremonial law on how God wanted his people to worship him in these ceremonies or in these religious duties or activities. Then third, there was the civil law. There was the law that governed relationships between people, um, such as, what's, what's a law? Oh, <laughs> if I'm out in the field and I throw up my, my hoe or my pickaxe, and the head from the pickaxe dislodges and kills one of your cattle, then you can come and get one of my cattle or something to that effect. It was a civil law governing between peoples, dealing with relationships. Not saying that the moral law or that the uh, ceremonial laws didn't, but the emphasis of the civil law was on that fashion. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 through 17. Number one, God says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Verse four, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. The three realms of dominion. Remember we talked about that? Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. There is a debate amongst scholars because in the Aramaic, it doesn't say, I am a jealous God. Scripture says in the Aramaic, I am a zealous God or a passionate God. So that's an interesting note. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Science and epigenetics has shown that these, that the choices that we make, the decisions that we make, there's a genetic imprint that gets passed along. So in a sense, literally and physically, the sins of the fathers pass on to the third and fourth generation. It's a genetics thing via DNA. So God was literally saying that this is what happens. But for every negative consequence, God has a positive consequence. Look, look, what, look at what he says in uh, verse 6. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Also, that thou shalt take or thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. The Sabbath, mind you, this isn't something that originated with the Ten Commandments. This isn't something that originated in the Mosaic Law. Keeping the Sabbath was a principle that God instituted from the very beginning. On the seventh day, he rested because it was holy to him. That's the Sabbath. The Sabbath day is a principle. It's something that can benefit you. It's the principle of rest. God, God made it a commandment saying, keep the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, 
and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This verse right here very clearly shows that God created the world in six days. Six literal, regular days. Not six different time periods, not six different time frames, not six periods of 1,000 years, not six undisclosed amounts of times like theistic evolutionists would propagate, but six regular days. There's no reason to believe otherwise. Anyone reading the scripture would conclude that these are just six regular days, like you observe a 24-hour period. That's a regular day. Because, and I emphasize that, there are people that are teaching that creation happened, it wasn't six literal days, 24-hour periods. It was six prolonged, undetermined amounts of time. And then they weave this elaborate explanation as to why it's so. And it's just not true. It doesn't fit with the scripture. So I want to make you aware of that. Why would anyone conclude anything other than six literal days unless somebody told them that, along with other teachings and doctrines of the Bible? You normally wouldn't conclude to something like that. And again, there's the rule to the exception. Somebody out there probably has, does, and is. But that's life. So, six days. Six literal days. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Now, it is said that scholars differentiate between the word kill and murder. And what that verse really is saying, thou shalt not murder. And the emphasis is on the intent, with hatred and hostility to take a life, which differentiates from killing in battle or in a war because we know that Moses and Israel fought wars and they killed and here you have a commandment thou shalt not kill well no that doesn't make sense so we have to properly divide rightly divide the word of God and understand that there's a difference between killing and murder and the difference is the intent of the heart so the intent of the heart is placed uh, on thou shalt not kill. So the idea behind it is do not murder or commit murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. These have to do with relationships because if you steal something from me, then our relationship is going to be a little stressed. I'm going to be tried with a little fire and my anger is probably going to be kindled against you but I know that you won't steal from me. Praise God. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, which is something that happened <laughs> repeatedly with Jesus. The Pharisees tried to set him up, so they're breaking the commandments right there. Lying and bearing false witness. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. God said, thou shalt not covet it. So now we've made it to the place of the Ten Commandments in the scripture, and the, uh, the ceremonial laws are going to follow sometime, and so are the civil laws. And this is really going to allow us to get the mind of God and show us how God thinks and what His mind consists of. This will be a blessing because this will help us to know who God is and will allow us to serve Him. After all, the context is relationship, and it's a love thing. And we want to walk in love and love God with all of our hearts. God bless you all, grace be with you, and peace from our Father. I pray that this was a blessing to you, that you've been stirred up to pray and to go out of your way to take time and pray. In Jesus' name.